<laughs> Hi, my name is Stephen Johnson. Uh, this is our final session before we uh, head off to uh, beers no, and no, su not. super secret. There's, there's super secret. And super secret members. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. All right. It's not so, the final. But uh, what we are going to have is a panel discussion about government agencies. Essentially, we're going to continue the uh, discussion that uh, Laren has just started and synthesize a lot of the discussion that's gone on today. Um, a lot of, I want to start with some general issues and move to some more specific issues that we've been talking about with uh, inflation, data quality, things like that. Um, we've only been allotted a half an hour, but I think it's okay if we run over a little bit because I think um, we have enough to, uh, we have enough time to expose the issues, not enough to delve into all of them, but what I hope to tee up is some useful discussions for uh, cocktail time and dinner time later on so that we can talk about that. Um, one of the invited panelists, Richard Wheat, who is uh, a longtime member of the OpenStreetMap community, uh, could not be here. And uh, I was greatly looking forward to his input on the panel today. So what I would like to do in order to uh, facilitate the greater discussion between uh, all of the different communities in this room is to kind of uh, I'd like to kind of maybe take the first half of this and toss some uh, some questions out for the panel to get uh, a sense of uh, what uh, these uh, three government uh, these three um, uh, different government perspectives have to offer, and then open it up to the rest of the the larger group here to uh, discuss some of the issues. Um, so what I'd like to do is give each of the panelists uh, a 15, second, uh, 15 seconds to introduce themselves. Good. Carl Anderson, <laughs> uh, formerly of Fulton County, Georgia. Uh, Ron is, is with Nizhik. I'm with URISA and formerly with Georgia URISA. So I'm Tim Trainer from the Census Bureau, uh, Geography Division. We, I'm responsible for the Tiger. So I'm Larry, and here's the rest of the story. I can't afford for OpenStreetMap to get ahead of us because then that creates more confusion for the citizens. So that's part of the reason I'm here is I want to figure out how to integrate our data so that we're in sync, uh, for lack of a better term, with OpenStreetMap. Good. All right. Um, I, I want to start off with a, a question for the panelists. Um, I've heard it talked about kind of in generalities, but I haven't heard it asked explicitly. Um, in essence, why are you here? What do government agencies, specifically what do your agencies, what do your uh, governments uh, see in OpenStreetMap? What's the motivation? And how do you characterize your current level of uh, interest in OpenStreetMap? How about if I start at the national level work a little So, um, if you go back 30 years in the whole mapping community, one of the goals was reduce duplication of effort. That's really one of the goals because it's a cost to all of us, and so that that's a that's a priority that we have. Um, with this community, it's a whole different uh, dynamic, and so from our perspective, we we like other agencies have to keep up a, a national database, a national data set for very specific purposes. We can't we're not allowed to do the things that we're not authorized to do. But the bottom line is that for the Census Bureau, I can speak for us, uh, we need to have a current ad, uh, address uh, list, we have, have to have a current street uh, 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 map for the whole nation, and we have to have a current boundary network. And so we look to the best sources we can uh, to maintain that. Twenty years ago, we were the source, us, USGS, National Imagery uh, Agency, National Mapping Agency, uh, it, it was a top-down approach. Now it's completely different. It's a bottom-up approach. And so the best source we view is, is at the local level. Right now we view that from a local government perspective. Uh, but clearly the OSM community is, a, is, a, is I say, as I say, a new dynamic. And I think we have to be aware of that and address that in, a, in an appropriate way. We, we want to rule the world. And we think you guys can help us. <laughs> no, I'm serious because it's significant, uh, particularly with MapQuest, and that free caching of tiles. They're caching tiles faster than I can, I guarantee you. And so, 
however long, I mean, it took us eight years to build the damn thing. So what if it takes us five more to figure out how to do this? It'll be done. And then we will have this ubiquitous map in this one place at least. So uh, you had mentioned that you, you can't afford to get behind the curve. Someone else can't have better data than you. And in several times throughout my time at Fulton County, something popped up. At one time, private roads were outside our purview of interest. We don't pave them. We don't stripe them. They don't exist until 911 calls started to come up on them. And they go, oh my god, what's going on? How do we build back 20 years worth of data? And I think OpenStreetMap is a way, local sourcing of that information is a way to keep us honest. Let us know where stuff is happening that we think doesn't matter. Forest service roads in the west sometimes, major source of, of uh, transportation. Lots of counties and states don't care about it. And that's, so that's a place where OpenStreetMap I think does and will. And keep them honest, being able to compare data. If all you have is census and you don't have anything else, only is county data, nothing else, you can't say that they're missing something because you can't see it. I think with OSM, it makes us do a better job. Let's take the flip side of that. Um, if, if, you're, uh, if, if government agencies are looking to OSM for rapid updates, then uh, what compelling reasons or how would you um, convince the OSM community that your agencies had a, a data set worth importing? I don't think we have to because she just said upload it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure there's much convincing to be done. So, Do so we have to? I mean, that's kind of why I'm here. Look, I thought you guys had a secret handshake. I mean, <laughs> evidently not. You just upload it. <laughs> get a username, get on the top line. Okay. <laughs> Is the question is do we have is everything we have better than everything you have or is the question do we possess one fact that you're lacking <laughs> and and I'm sure do you possess one fact that we're lacking so we shouldn't delete all of your facts and replace them with our facts we should That's find true. a way to put them together true I mean you're collecting information that, uh, that in some cases we we are very interested in you're collecting a lot of other information that we have no interest in uh, I I you know the, the storm drains I. Census isn't counting storm drains, uh, but it's important. Yeah, yes. But it, but it's important right. to somebody. That's exactly right. So so the the point is that it's a it's it's a, it's a shopping cart. You know, you're going to pick and choose those things that are important to you. Uh, jo Joseph Wakey, did I pronounce your name right? Yes. Okay. Uh, he mentioned uh, in in his presentation earlier today that. Um, uh, that you're going to go out and you're going to validate uh, some of the data. You know, people will put it in, but you're going to have a validation process in there. Um, I'm assuming that for some of your missions that you'll want to validate some data that comes in through OSM, or how, how, what's the degree of trust that you have in OSM data? Um, how do you validate the data? Um, how, how do you deal with data integrity issues, I suppose, with OSM? Um, the way that um, I, I did not implement it this way. The way I would want to have is to watch the editor. At some point, you're going to learn to trust someone uploading data. Um, and you're going to get a sense. If it's a one-time person, maybe you don't give as much credence to it. But if a person has a long history of making good edits and putting good data in, I put a lot more weight on it. Um, the, it's very expensive to find your mistakes. It's relatively cheap to find, drive, send a person out to go look at a single road and see what's missing instead of letting them go drive around until they find something they haven't seen before. Okay. So we, again, just on the whiteboard as we kind of think this through, we, um, our office doesn't own the data, right? I mean, we're not even the contributor. We're, we're not even the maker. It's the county people. So it's their data. So what we kind of see at the... First thing we want to do is we want to pass those edits to the county. It'll be up to them whether they incorporate it in their data or accept it or not. But for us at the state level, what we're thinking is, is it's a separate layer, for lack of a better term, um, that would be in an operations center, for example. So the statewide road centerline file with all of these additional edits that have been made through OSM. But ultimately, we can't incorporate those into the state database because they are not, because uh, we don't manage, I mean, we don't create the state database, it's the counties. That's a convoluted answer. How's that for government? So, so if you bounce that up one level up, you know, and trying to put all this together from a nationwide perspective, it gets a little bit more complicated. 
So when we look at uh, data sources, we, we are looking at certain minimum criteria that will pass or not pass. In some cases, if it's spatial data, it's by its accuracy. And we'll test the files. We'll actually have ind independent processes that test the, the quality of that file. For attribution, it's a different story. We're really at the, at the, at the mercy of the data provider. But I think as you walk down this path, uh, I'm convinced that the way we have to manage this data is at the basic level. So in my case, I'm interested in addresses, features, and boundaries. It's going to be at the address level, the individual address level that we have to maintain the data. At the feature level, it's got to be at that individual feature instance. That's the only way you're really going to be able to know whether you have good stuff or not. That's a major undertaking, but it's one that we're working toward, uh, and I think it's going to be necessary. A related question, um, and, and Laren, you, you talked about this with in terms of like managing changes. Don't we have a big job associated with data conflation and ensuring subsequent edits don't overwrite legitimate changes? And maybe some of the uh, maybe some of the issues that Mike Mugersky talked about in his presentation, where we're going from micro levels to macro levels. How, what kinds of processes do we need to put into place in order to um, manage those? Are those in any way related? One word, metadata. That, that, that's, that's what allows us to manage the data. Uh, 20 years ago we didn't have metadata. Today we do. So it gets back to the point I just made about at what level are you going to manage this? We used to manage the metadata at a county level. We would say this is the statement about that county. It wasn't very useful. Uh, that's why you have to drill down to the lowest levels possible. But if you have good, good information, you have metadata is information, if you have good information, then you can make a decision about whether you replace, whether you keep, whether you adjust. Did you repeat that question? I was um, interested in uh, managing changes, um, data conflation, um, specifically how do, you, how do you make sure that that's the right edit, but that's the, you know, that's a how, how do you make sure that your data quality is maintained? How do you uh, deal with data conflation? That those two addresses are really this address or that road is really the same as this road? And how do you know so, which versioning? Yeah. And so, so we operate on the 90-10 rule. 90% um, of the work takes 10% of the time. And so um, with our road centerline file, when we started eight years ago, Man, we started just throwing stuff in there, right? Because we just needed to get something to get the program going. And then we went back and we revised that over time as it got better, not unlike what you guys have been doing forever. It's a shame we weren't doing this together, right? But what I found is that the revisions and changes over time um, are not near as big a challenge as at a first initial bound, right? So I've got a huge undertaking on this first initial conflation, crosswalk, whatever you want to call it, to get into OSM. After that, I'm not so sure it's that big a deal. I think we got a 90-10 a rule here. I think. I'll tell you next year. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the level of detail associated with uh, OpenStreetMap vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a lot of the government, um, the government databases. Uh, David Cole mentioned uh, in his presentation that uh, they had to uh, adjust the MapQuest renderer to deal with bike trails and things like that. And uh, Joseph, in his presentation, um, talked about um, allowing citizens to map potholes and things like this. Um, what value does hyperlocal data like that have for state, federal, local agencies? And at what point is it, does it, is some of it noise or is some of it, is there a compelling, do government agencies have a compelling interest in data at that level? Yes. It's, it's a lot easier to ignore something than it is to create it out of whole cloth. And so it's easier to say, I don't want to see a bike trail, just suppress it. So our, <laughs> Our database is already big. <laughs> uh, it's huge, uh, and to maintain that, um, you know, it takes a lot of hardware and a lot of people and a lot of expertise. Um, so I guess from my perspective, uh, I'm interested in the data that's important to us for the work that we have to do. Um, 
there is data that I'm very interested in that would help us in our work, but I don't want to put it in, say, for example, I don't want to put it in a database, but I want to use it. I want to tag it. I want to, I want to hook it into our data. So, say, for example, navigation data. That's a perfect example. I don't think the Census Bureau should be sitting there managing and updating on an hourly or by minute basis navigation data, because that's what you have to do. You know, One-way streets change in the course of the day. But I'd like to use it because it would help us get people to where they need to be. So if I can, if I can acquire that source, tag it, pop it in, use it at the time I need it, and then let it go, that's, that's, that's the kind of situation I want to be in. For other data that's not very meaningful to us, I'd rather not have it. I'd rather have access to it when I need it, but I'd rather not have it. This, I want to uh, encourage you at this point, I guess, to uh, ask questions or follow-ups to uh, any other questions that you know we've asked to this point or, um, or any of the future questions here. Um, uh, David in Cole in his presentation talked about uh, AOL and MapQuest giving back uh, to the OSM development community. And um, what uh, responsibility do government agencies have to give back to the OSM community? And if so, what shape might that take? So this, <clears throat> this one's kind of interesting to me because if I fast forward five years from now, um, looking at the crystal ball, what if we did manage whole state systems? I know, don't let anybody quote. Dang, where's the camera on? <laughs> <laughs> what if you did? I mean, let's think about that. That'd be kind of interesting. I can't, as a state, I would never want to put, or I would never want a proprietary organization to, to serve as my hosting organization, right? So Google being Microsoft, Yahoo, doesn't matter, MapQuest. But as a nonprofit, what if that was possible, right? So what if all of our data, base maps, and everything else um, went through there? Probably could do it for a lot less than what I pay now in, in other mechanisms. So would a state, I think the real question is, financially, could a state or local organization contribute funds to the organization or the entity to maintain hosting and services? In our case, I'd have to get the Attorney General to get back with you on that. No, I think we could. Um, I think something like that would be interesting. So five years from now, that, that might be an interesting thing. I think that it presents some uh, unique challenges as I think through that. That could be fun. But does that change what OpenStreetMap is doing then? Because now you're, then you're, that makes you more OpenStreetMap into more of a data sharing center. Whereas right now it's a data editing center. The, 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 the assumption is your quality is always going to improve through the tyranny of the masses. You know, people aren't going to tolerate inaccuracy through the data. It might last for a short time, but eventually somebody's going to be like, hey, this is wrong, and fix it. You know, and you're, you might have wiki wars, but generally speaking, it's going to be accurate because of that. So when you talk about uploading a data for a particular state or a county, and then you, are you going to be able to differentiate between the two? And then are you going to be able to download an entire data set? Because is that what OpenStreetMap is supposed to be? Yeah, and, and, and I guess I should clarify, I'm not referring, uh, I probably said it uh, wrong, I'm not referring to a data from a clearinghouse standpoint, I'm talking about the services and the map that OSM could provide, right? Because we have our own base map and our own services that we stand up, and there's significant costs there. It, let, let me be clear also about the question that I asked. Um, I, I'm not necessarily thinking, you know, the Census Bureau or Laren, you know, State of Arkansas is going to cut a check to OSM, although that's conceivable. But oh, that's what you were asking. But, <laughs> but what what sorts of what sorts of activities can government agencies do to foster the community or to develop the kind of mechanisms that feed the community or that are kind of reciprocate that develop the kind of reciprocal feedback loops that we've been talking about in several of the presentations. You today. guys need more That's, mappers. Can I paraphrase? You had said respons absolutely. responsibility. In local governments, Joe touched on this a little bit, we have responsibility to our citizens. All, all of us in government have some responsibility sure. to our citizens. Um, one of the things that government data does very poorly is foster innovation. In our current world especially, if we hold it in our own little silos, it doesn't go very far. 
we can get our government data, the, the work of our sweat, into a place that people can innovate on top of it, we're getting a lot more value for our citizens than any other mechanism we could, could have. That, that's not an easy sell for politicians. Well, but you're touching 99% of in. Yeah. Right? But I, I would think, I mean, I'm not a GIS professional, but um, OSM has a much different metadata model and requirement than, you know, FTDC and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Right? Right. I mean, I have seen local government people talking on blogs about using OSM as their data store. How can they do without the metadata? I, I'm not, I'm, I'm more focused on the sleeping map, right? I've got my own that has servers that blink and I have to pay for all that. What if I use yours? But, and, and the metadata, it's not the metadata that doesn't exist. It was, meta, like, FGDC metadata was designed around a different conceptual, conceptual yeah. model, right? Around how the data is gathered, how it's stored. It doesn't mean that they're, that it's not acceptable to have that metadata that OSM does. It just have to be a realization that they're different. And, and how does that right. map? Maybe what, well, maybe what there's something missing. Like, would you, in order to be accepted, would you have to, include the degree of precision in the GPS receiver or something like that, yeah. which you can optionally do now. I mean, we don't have any process steps that are right. anything. I don't see, you know, there, there isn't a, a convention of even recording the model GPS that you use and what time of day. So we have all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, earlier this afternoon we had this uh, back and forth about, um, to my way of thinking, the difference between a rendering database or re rendering data source and a, and a real spatial database. And in, in the case of wanting to do multiple representation, multiple scale representations, you know, there's there's a there's a quick approach that Steve was talking about. Just I'll I'll get it up there and I'll get it in. Versus, well, how about that we look at the nature of the data and we process it and we generalize it and we go through all of that. Those are two very different approaches. And I think that for 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 us, we're we're a maintainer of a true spatial database that we want to because we have to maintain topology. We have to assure relationships. I have to be sure that your house is in the right census block, or I've misallocated population. So that's a very important thing for us to maintain. How we render it is a whole different topic, and we all know we can do better at that. But but that that's a that's a different that's a different question. That's a different goal. The value I see in the work that OSM is doing is that uh, you have you have the citizenry, you have the you have the citizen mappers, so they can look at any area they're interested in and they can make the changes that they think are necessary based on their experience. Uh, that doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean that it's correct. But it but it does indicate a change. And so that's something that getting back to a point that Larry made earlier. If we can get into a transaction environment where we can take advantage of the good work that's being done by those folks, then we can evaluate whether, the, yes, that's, that's correct according to our standards, according to whatever standards are decided, and it can go in and be part of a, a different course. It minimizes duplication of effort. It prevents me from having to go out and do the same thing because I'm going to have to do it. So, so that's a benefit. I, I really see, really see a benefit of the OSM community from that perspective. So, that's, uh, if we were to look at, at all the things in OSM as facts, maybe observations, big fact management system, and the census has to manage its own facts. I heard this rumor from this county or from this state, or I heard it from OSM. They need to manage your facts, where you got it, how it works. And the more partners you have, there's another source. OSM is managing its facts. Census is managing its facts. In some way, there's a feedback. You mentioned one way. OSM tells you what's changing. There has to be some other way where you're telling OSM what's changing. No, it's likely. Yeah. And, and it may not be feature edits. It may be something else. Maybe even level of confidence that we're talking to each other about our fact systems. That, that may enable us to be symmetric. Might as well talk about converging or diverging. We could be symmetric. But, but collaborate. Yeah, that, that's a different dynamic, and I think it's one we ought to pursue. I, I think that's a good thing. I think all these things um, revolve around one issue, and that's really flagging. Because whichever way you're going to push the data, whether it's whether you want to be notified of the change or you want to push the data out, the question is, how is the two pieces of data separate, and, and how do you recognize this? So in other words, you create an envelope around that point and then say, Everything that says, you know, World Congress Center within 250 feet of here, you know, we should compare all those four different data points. Because that that's really what the issue comes down to, because then 
you give people a tool on either side, whether it's an institutional side or a citizen mapper side. I have a good example. I walked in here and there's a dot on the uh, on uh, the World Congress Center. It's kind of in the middle of the center. It says Ellis Street. And Ellis Street was demolished uh, when they built the Georgia Dome. Was that 92? It was a little while ago. Uh, the dot exists. It's probably going to exist in state records forever. They don't like changing, they don't like changing addresses. Um, and that's one of those weird facts that somehow we need to collect that extra information. Steve? So I think this, this idea about whether OpenStreetMap is, is a true geodatabase and whether it has standards and accuracy and all this is really just a proxy for the problem that everybody collecting map data has, whether they're a government or an outtech or a teleatlas or local government or whatever, which is you, all of those guys have very high standards and big, um, you know, very broad standards that tell you the 52 types of road you can collect and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the people entering the data are paying the minimum wage. And they're out there driving around and they make those and those mistakes. But governments and companies can fire people, right? Or retrain them. In an open street map, you can't, you don't have that control. Right? And that's partly why CloudMate was set up, right? You pay us and you can tell us off if the data's back, and you can go to a host of other companies. So isn't it really about that? Isn't it really about controlling where the data comes from more than the, the, the standard? And and nobody likes the idea from the traditional industry that you can't have that control. It's not control, it's knowing, it's the knowledge, it's, it's, it's being able to decide whether the data are to, to your standard or whether the data are good enough for your purpose. I mean, we're in the same boat. We, we, we hire a lot of temporary workers. We just had 700,000 of them walking the streets. We paid them, but they weren't paid a high price. Uh, and, and we use the data that they collected. Uh, but at some point, we're going to see whether that data was good or not because we're going to get uh, the calls that Laring gets times 50 uh, to tell us whether we've done the right thing or not. So it, it, I think it's a, it's a matter of just the knowledge. It's, it's whether the, the information we get is good. Um, I'm just curious, something Carlos brought up, and, and it came up with the USGS BGI um, workshop, was understanding that, so right now in OpenStreetMap, whenever an edit's made, one edit by, by either distance or by person is equal. An edit's an edit is equal to one, right? But if you could start incorporating either the variance of that edit or even understanding who's making it, because in OpenStreet, I've been tracking the entire history and logging credentials of that person and start understanding it. So, Carl, you had mentioned earlier about understanding this person tends to make lots of edits or higher quality edits or understanding that they are actually, maybe even down the road somewhere, they are an actual surveyor in real life. So, maybe, you know, plus one on them. Um, and so, being able to potentially start, if you have all these people making edits, is, as you start tracking them, give me all the really high, you know, high trust level. High, um, high reliability edits, because I want to know those first. And maybe you wouldn't necessarily blindly trust them, or at least a, a higher probability they're accurate. I want to know them first, and then down that level or something. And I like wonder if that would be... Like rated user? Yeah, essentially. But I mean, implicit in the system. You can actually see that one person made an edit, and afterwards, their edits are always immediately changed and fixed. So over time, they're low quality, versus someone makes an edit, and almost no one ever bumps that edit again. They maybe only bump it around just a tiny little bit. Right, so therefore, that person over time tends to be more trustworthy. The edits they make are trusted by more and more people. But you're you're always going to come back to the issue of how do you compare data points and how do you know when two data points are actually the same, the same thing. No, but what, um, when, because what's... because like I understand what you're saying. I agree, like about rating, user ratings, like basically saying that when you, you know when you have this person who's making loads of edits and everybody agrees that they're good, that their rating's going to go up. That that's that's the meta game. So that's fine. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's a really neat and interesting thing to look at. But the issue is always going to come back to how, how do, what happens when three people make the same edit, but they put in three different points? What happens now with that in the OS Well, see, that's, that's what I'm getting to. Because like, you were saying that it's talking about control. And I'm saying I just need a way to evaluate it. Because, OK, these, these points, like let's say somebody puts down a point for the Denny's restaurant. And one guy puts it 1,500 feet over there, one guy puts it here, and then another person, they put it over that way down the street. And coming back to your issue about creating a metagame around the editor quality, okay, how do you know that those are all three the same points? Because they're not exactly coincident. What if one guy, what if they sell it, spell it differently? Like one guy uses a capital D. So how do you know to compare those three points? Fourth, fifth, and sixth, and hundred and twenty first, and sixth, and any would would that, that but, would. But, but, but see, as you get more and more users, 
it's going to be more likely that somebody's going to be doing stuff like, I'm, I'm not even going to look. I'm just going to click this thing here. Because I've, I've got a mobile app. More than one point blank, you're right. Because one of the things that we're struggling with um, with data collection, you, your World Congress Center example is perfect because there's two addresses. There's one on International and there's one on Ellis, and both of them are like in the middle of the plot. Which one is the routable address? So there might be two. When you do address points in, in our data structure, we use a map list, there's two points. There's one that's in the middle of the plot, but there's one that's associated with the edge of pavement that's going to be where you route to. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, you know, you would say there may be three different points. Yeah, you you one might be right. Yeah, yeah, I got one on this. Maybe, maybe, True. maybe it's good to think about it in, in this way. But instead of um, you know, having these definite problems, like how are you going to tell which point is correct, think about it as a cost benefit trade off going forward. Right? What I keep hearing from governments, especially, is yes, we're getting all this input, but we don't have a man how we can deal with it. So you, even, even if you solve all of those problems, what are you going to do with all of this data? Is one thing. And then the benefit going forward is, is massive. Like you get these free services provided by the company, you get some data set, you get lots of people entering the data. And what will you lose? You lose a little bit of being able to have definite knowledge of where the data came from. But I'm not having a statistical way of doing it as I'm not even really talking it up. This thing I paid for. Just like where it's going out now. See a logo on it. I guess I'll like, fall in. But I'm just talking about from the point of view of an actor. Because, you know, it's it's kind of like your question always comes back. Because now, when you talk about bringing the user ratings into it, creating a kind of metagame around how uh, the culture that you're building in, you know, because there's going to be people out there that want to be the highest rated mapper in the world. Issue that I'm, I, I, I'm kind of struggling with, and I struggle with it professionally as well as you know, like in things that I might deal with personally. Uh, in the method, is how do I even compare all the data? And how do I, and how do I, it's not even a question of who's right or who's wrong. I just want to know about the that's, yeah, that's, that's, I think that gets back to it. Turner, you, I mean, that's cool. That would be neat, but it would be relevant to me as government because I just want to know about the change. So, They're still going to, I mean, whether it's right or wrong, a local government, I, I shouldn't say all local government, local government in Arkansas still wants to maintain their data in their box. They shared it out and they still want to keep it theirs and they still want to validate everything that goes in. But th there's a huge amount of value to them to know about change. And so that's, that's, where it's, that's where it's useful. Steve, you were talking about trust as if the big problem from governments is trusting OpenStreetMap. And I think we do trust, to a degree, what's going on. To, to the big problem I see, and I've heard this from different sources here, it's the suitability of the data model for a particular purpose. Is OSM in the U.S. good for routing? Well, it can be put oh, together. Yes, but that's the problem. Just well, yeah. I know, but there's, there are different uses for the data. There's, there's routing, there's depiction, there's topological relationships, there's some historical relationships. There's other ways. That, I think if we could get the models together, the trust problem isn't the big one. It's that we don't see how to use OSM data in all of our use. You know, OSM doesn't matter. And, and so we can't make the jump as quickly as, we, as you'd like to to your model because it does it has some bigger issues in these forms. Mm -hmm. now, if we could get that problem fixed, I think that the trust issue is not as big as you think it is. There, there's not a local government agency in the state of Arkansas that would trust OSM. I'm just being honest. They don't know who you are. They don't trust you. You, you feed them a thousand feedbacks over the course of three years, they're going to start trusting you. And, and, and that's... That's where we have to start the team building exercise, which will start as soon as I build, upload our data. <laughs> and and if, I, if, I, <laughs> if, if I receive that data coming in, I would never just drop it into the Tiger database. It would be sitting on the outside. We'd do an evaluation of it, and then we would say yes or no, and it goes in. Question. Uh, what, what form would be good for you guys to get these, these change feedbacks on? Uh, just like take a dip in the database and any change to a vote in Arkansas, we send you a little 
smell to some of A GRSS feed, a shape, a, a something. Yeah, it exactly the work for you that. As long as there's something, they'll come to that, right? So, I mean, it, it, yeah. they are saying that we're saying that. Just, if there's something that they can go to, exactly, just some way to go and find out. So, we have those. Yeah, we have several of them. So, so I think the big, the big problem, and, and it's not big, and yes, I'm a Rails developer, and I should just go fix it, is right now, any change set in a bounding box, you have all these bot edits that happen all over the place. Yeah. So the change set is no longer that useful. You can't see what's going on in the history. It's just a, it's a query problem. It's a very small problem, but it's the one that is that too much noise. Right. So when you, when, you, when you subscribe to DC, you almost see DC edit. So, right? But if, in whatever format, I think we're at your point. Right? That's what you're saying, right? So, 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 so this is more than this. to an area. Is it, you know, the individual government data sets, they don't, they're probably not going to want that free. But, but, but doesn't it get back to what Carl was saying earlier that, you know, it's easier to ignore it than it is to create it, yeah, right? Yeah, we can filter that. Sorry. It's, so, so Stephen asked earlier what, what, sorry, my voice. You know, how we would want to work in this environment. And, and so as an example of this discussion, one of the things that I would be interested in is, is having dialogue with folks to figure out a process in which this would work well. And, and I would, I would, I would hope that Laren would be in the room and others would be in the room to have that conversation, so we have a common approach, because that that would work well. Lisa, so what, um, what process do you go through to make those visualizations showing all the edits? You know that they've shown. So that's as as someone who's done a lot of editing, I know that. If I had that sort of database, I could search by date, what's happened recently, or I can go to an area I'm really interested in updating downtown. I can either show them all on the screen at once, it'll show me a concentration of where people have edited, or I can pan through to any particular time. I'm only interested in the recent ones because I know we've taken care of the other ones. And it's just a backdrop to your ArcGIS map, and but there's some kind of time scale thing where you could zoom in to a particular area or see a particular snapshot. But how could we get could we get it in that? That's not way? personally directed to me, is well, it? Well I'm just asking <laughs> you're, you're asking this but I know, as an editor, I <laughs> right, know right. that that's what I would like to see. You know, if I'm you, doing my work. You want to be able I think I think you want to be able to query the wiki based on geography or time. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's not even versioning, really, because it, 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 the version is the same. It's just being edited and modified. But just to get those lines. Yeah. Sir? So, so what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing, and I'm hearing it in, in, in little bursts of I want this and I want that, is really, you're, there's, well, I see two different problems. And I'm, part of the problem is so there's two conceptual problems that we're dealing with. One is that we're dealing with two separate types of government interaction from OSM's standpoint. Um, and the other is that we're dancing around a problem that's not being addressed. So let's address the first one is some governments just want to give us data and make it easy for us to do what, 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 we, what we want and don't want anything about it. And, and we've, heard, we've heard from some of them. Others, like yourselves, um, want some kind of feedback, but everybody's interest in feedback is a little different. So really the question comes down to what type of feedback mechanisms are you looking for, number one. And then the other is, what are you going to do? So we can provide you feeds and we can do things, but then the other part is if you want some of that feedback back, you know, it's going to be up to you to also create some of those tools. So you know, we can we can on OSM's side make it easy to, to visualize and to give you feeds. But the question is, you know, if you guys want that connector, you know, you can't just say, oh, we need a connector or we're never going to make it work. Well, okay, so help us make a connector I mean, that, that fits your needs. So, so so I would respond to that in a couple ways. One is that um, uh, the one thing I'm most interested in is uh, new data. So in other words, when a housing unit goes up or a new street goes in uh, and I don't have it, that's something I'm very interested in. So that's one. Secondly, I'm interested in change data. So for example, if it's a matter of um, new attribution or different attribution or, or 
different alignment of features. I'm interested in that, but to a lesser extent than the, the newer data. So in getting to your second point about, so how can we do this? I mean, one of the ways that we could work this out is um, having our folks talk with you to work out a process. That's one way. Uh, second, second, to be quite frank about it, is that if we have money to help pay for development of certain uh, functions that make that transition easy, that's another option that we can look at. So there, there are different ways that we could pursue this. But I think that um, what we're saying is that we, I think that, that this, is, this is another option for us to acquire the kind of data that we need to do our mission. Yeah. Uh, right. So it's a fair question, right? Because you guys are all volunteers, and I mean, it blows my mind that you know some of you are here on vacation. I mean, that's like real dedication, right? So it's a fair question, and I think what I would say is this may already exist, but some type of feed that shows change. I want all of it. Right. And then it's on me to contract with any number of people probably in this room to build a tool to query that change to give me what I want. That's right. There's also a small issue of licensing, right? At least some, yeah. some of you guys can't accept our changes because our license is not public domain. Well, that, that gets back to, you know, my data is open, open, and yours is kind of... <laughs> I was going to wade into Sorry. the licensing issue with some trepidation given the uh, wars that have gone on on the uh, list. And, um, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I, I did wonder if there weren't some, uh, since, uh, what are the restrictions in terms of, you know, government data, of course, is public domain, or in the United States it is anyway, but uh, not always, I understand. Uh, but with, by and large, most of most like property records, street center line nope. data, things like that. Nope. Not in the state of Georgia. Oh. Not in the state of Arizona. Not in the state of Arizona. Okay. With with some exceptions. <laughs> but with a lot of exceptions. Uh, it, it, yeah, there's 50 states, and, and and many of them have public records laws where um, a lot of government data is, is public data, and depending on the data set, and there's always super secret ones, and there's always um, restrictions on that. But um, with some caveats, most of the data is public domain data. Um, it's true with all the federal data, the federal data that are collected, the hydrography. Which, and, where are you getting in trouble when you say most? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Oh, there's Fine. Stop. There's a good deal of... There's a, good, there's a great deal of, of public domain data Steven, out there. can I put a little, one extra idea in your head? Yes. Um, What's the difference between OSM and a government record? Some of our centerline data is a government yes. record, right. which has special properties right. beyond with which something like OSM could provide us. And there is things like working data models, which OSM, there is some natural work where we could do things together. Right. And so it's, and part of it is our interests. What, what are all of our interests? And I don't think we're hiding them, but we may need to just state that one of the reasons we can't work together on this narrow issue is we have interests that we can't uh, we can't consolidate. We don't all have interests in this area. We all do have interests here. We're going to work together here. We're going to have to work separately here because we can't unify our interests. Do By interest, do you also mean missions, like our missions? Like this data may not be suitable for our mission. I, and I, one other thing I want to toss in here, um, since this is, is required by federal law to not disclose certain information. Right. And so they have an extra burden. Even though their data is public domain, except in certain circumstances, they can't give it back. I mean, if you gave them data, I don't think you could give them address data back out again. No, know. address data, yeah, there, there are certain data that are constrained under Title 13 of the U.S. Code. But if you if you were to give me road data, I have a responsibility to give that back because that is in the public domain. Right. Uh, but if you were to give me address data or your housing unit locations, those two things right now are under the constraints in terms of a spatial data network. I, I, I have no idea how, because um, I have not followed the OSM licensing debacle. Um, <laughs> 
but it appears to be a debacle from an outsider. Um, but when you were, when you were saying that, so you, you, are you suggesting that there's some licensing issue with you with OSM sharing changes? Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Okay. But we can tell you where a change occurred, um, and you can do what you wanted with that. Data. Perfect. But if we started to tell you this road is now called B Street instead of A Street, then and did that in sufficient quantities, then copyright uh, and database rights and sort of where rights may or may not attach to that. And we have protections over some of those things that just mean that if you use them, you have to give back your subsequent changes, which would affect your data set too. Perfect. Right. That's the give and take. We just got to have that conversation, right? We are we are almost out of time. Do we have one more I'm one more question? Denny's. One more question for our panelists, and then we're all headed to Denny's for <laughs> beers. Any any further questions for our panelists? Thank you very much, all.